my darkened eyes, the fix my heart in the transcendental knowledge. He is my Lord, the birth of the birth. From whom is that I pray my enemies, but how he begins to destroy me. The Vedic scriptures in the Sikhara. Our spiritual master is the ocean of mercy, the friend of the poor, the Lord and master of the devotees. O master, be merciful unto us, and give us the shade of your lotus feet. And may your fame be spread all over the universe. We pray to each other to your hands and knees, Srila Prabhupada. Srila Prabhupada, Ki Jai.
4, chapter 23, Maharaj Prithu is going back home, text 22. <coughs> Vidya Krityam Radhini Jala Paluta Tatvoda Kampar Tur Udhara Karmana Natva Dini Stama Stri Dasma Stri Paritya Vivesha Vani Dayayati Patrit Padau Thank you, Bhav. Thank you. Krishna Premier Prabhu for helping me. <laughs> I got in last night at like 1, 1 30, maybe later, I don't remember. It was a long drive from Simachalam. I'm sure most of you have been to Simachalam. Okay. Translation. After this, the Queen executed the, necess the necessary funerary, funerary functions and offered oblations of water. After bathing in the river, she offered obeisances to the various demigods situated in the sky 
in the different planetary systems. She then circumambulated the fire, and while thinking of the lotus feet of her husband, entered its flames. Oh, that's heavy. Sati. Purport by his divine graces, Bhaktivedanta Swami Shiva Prabhupada Jai Prabhupada. <clears throat> the entrance of a chaste wife into the flames of the prayer of her dead husband is known as Saha Gam Gamana, which means dying with the husband. This system of Saha Gamana have been practiced in Vedic civilization from the time immemorial. immemorial. Even after the British period in India, this practice was rigidly observed, but soon it degraded to the point that even when the wife was not strong enough to enter the fire of her dead husband, the relatives would force her to enter. Thus this practice had to be stopped. But even today, there are still some <clears throat> solitary cases where a wife will voluntarily enter the fire, die with her husband. Even after 1940, we personally knew of a chaste wife who died in this way. That's pretty heavy. <laughs> wow. That's hardcore. <laughs> I don't know how to comment on this one these days. I'll get in trouble from the Montagues. But, the, you know, the, the, the culture in India, quite a while ago, um, the subtleties of, of the reasons people did things, it was, it was so subtly connected to, um, you know, Sanatan Dharma, Vaishnavism, Vedic culture. And often in the West we see the externals, oh my God, why would she give up her life? She could have this, she could get remarried, have a good life. La di da di da. We think of this, you know, the, the, what we would do, and not the consequences of not doing something. So the consequences of, of why often the chaste wife did this was she gained so much incredible <laughs> merit, whether in the next life or going up into the heavenly planets, uh, depending on the tapasya of her husband or his position. So it was pretty interesting. <laughs> um, one experience I had was I was traveling from Ahobalam to another temple called Ram Tirtam, which I didn't know. It was hardly one hour from Ahobalam, because when I first started to search for Nishima, even my own guru told me, there's only a Hobalam. There's no other Nishinga temples in India. And I was like, that's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> right? Because in India, you, if, even if you go to Vrindavan, there's like a million Ganesh temples, Lakshmi, Saraswati, Sitaram, Lakshman, Hanuman, right? Why is there only going to be one place? So I um, heard from some locals, there's a place called Ram Tirtam. And this place is famous for women. Um, after their husbands die, they come and do tapasya or vratas there. They'll fast for one month or only eat one time, like sleep on the floor. <clears throat> and the reason they did this is so they didn't have to, it was a subtle way to not do sati, not go into the fire, but they would have to make up by doing heavy tapasya which is normally not what a lot of women in, in the Sanatan or Vedic culture did, heavy tapasya. There's only a few that did like serious, go to the jungle and give everything up. So on the way to this place, there was no buses at that time. So you I had to walk like 40 kilometers. So I started walking and there was a bullock cart that came and there was a bunch of people on it. Uh, too many. And um, they stopped and asked me if I wanted to get on. No, 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 because I saw it was full. <laughs> I don't want to be overcrowded. <laughs> and anyways, I ended up being convinced I got on. And we drove for 20 minutes and we got on an, 
another group wanted to fit on, but there was an old man, and he was he was dying, <clears throat> very old. So the only place to put him, his head was on my lap, and the rest of the people like held his body. It was interesting. It was mainly old women. They were massaging him, and his head was in my lap. And I was like, this is so weird, but I. <laughs> so today, and his wife was next to me, old. I mean, he must have been close to 100, but he was very youthful. And um, just seeing the the woman's mood, her soberness, she wasn't going crazy, you know, crying. And she was like holding his hand, and I was like, oh my god, China Shingade, this is so weird. I was very young at the time. I was like, he's in my space. So we got we started going to Ram Tirta because they already agreed to drop me there. And as soon as we were getting very close to the road, I could see the temple in the distance. He started breathing heavily. And if you've been around people that leave this place, that's the last thing they do. They take these amazing breaths. Like really powerful and then and generally it's like three to five. So he started doing this. So his wife like put her hand on his heart and they started chanting, Govinda, Hari Govinda, and everyone was chanting. And I was like, Darshanadev. So he took his last breath and he was very happy, he was smiling, looking right in my eyes. It was really hardcore. And then he was gone, just like peaceful, like he fell asleep. And then I arrived. And so the wife, she was so kind, she told me, she said, okay, your job is done, you can go now. And she took his head, I got up, and she put it in her lap, and then they carried on. And I always remember that, what then happened after that, you know, like the wife, the family. And I think that, obviously, she probably went to Ram Tirtam and did some but it was so fantastic to see the, the devotion of her helping him go and uh, chanting the, name, the names of the Lord. I was, I was like, wow, that's a lucky old guy. You know, no crying, nobody was wailing. Often we do, right? Our parents die or even our children, but they were, she was so like in it, you know. So the last thing wasn't his, him remembering, no, I'm leaving my family. <laughs> right? So um, <clears throat> it's very special. So in Ram Tirtam, when I made it there, Narshimadi is kind of in a little, like a stone cave. And um, he, he appeared to Parshuram, because after Parshuram slaughtered, was it 22 or 25, 25? Was it 21? Oh yeah, before he was going to do the 22nd. I think Narda Muni told me. Uh, I think that's enough. 21 generations of Shatriyas. That's a lot of people. Even though he was God, he still had to follow and he had to do tapasya and yakyas to be freed of this subtle uh, karmic debt. So he meditated, one of the places he meditated was in Ram Tirta. So it's believed this form of Narsimha manifests before him and like a Swayambhu form, self-manifested and he um, worshipped this form and then in order to do Abhishek he created Ram to be like Kund with his axe Kum, and the water came. I didn't realize even Chaitanya Mahaprabhu visited this place, apparently, they believe. Um, and obviously the Saptarishis, the Ramanuja, Madhva, you know. So when I was there, groups of women, young and old, were coming, and I was like, wow, I've never seen, normally, there's a lot of men, you know, in India. You don't see so many groups of ladies. And the first time I didn't realize why they were coming, and they were coming with like, you know, very 
a sober mood. It wasn't so festive and happy. So later on, as I went back there many more times, then I understood why they would come there. Their husband had died, and they would come do some heavy tapasya, um, which was pretty cool. <laughs> so yeah, <clears throat> very interesting for us. A lot of things in, at the time of the British, things that were very, um, I don't know, beautiful and simple and spiritual. Um, the British, not to talk bad about them or anybody, they, because of their influence, you know, they massively influenced India. Before, they, they actually couldn't infiltrate it too much because there was so much faith. Right? And one of their academics, his name was, uh, I think it was Mueller, he said they were trying for years, let's, let's get them through education, let's what, maybe tear down their buildings, build our style of buildings, let's, you know, give them tea. <laughs> and well, that was one of the things, there was no milk in tea before, it was just the spice tea. Um, and there was no caffeine. It was like a herbal tea, a healthy Ayurvedic tea. So the British brought the caffeine and the milk, and then it became chai. So they got them addicted to chai. And so this academic said, you know, he studied the philosophy. He actually translated the Puranas, many other books. So he, was, he told the leaders, he said, the only way we can get them is by destroying their faith giving them doubt. And the only way to do that is to become a Hindu. So many of them adopted Hinduism and actually stayed with it. They never, they actually became like followers of Sanatana Dharma. But unfortunately, they, they changed and twisted or made a lot of those beautiful kind of um, rituals that they would follow in the, in the, from the Vedas, they kind of changed them or made a lot of the Indians feel bad. And then they really pushed this caste system. You know. Before it was more about nature, not about caste, it was about people who are more Brahminical. So the Brahmins take, they're generally Brahmacharis and sannyas. Brahmins don't, traditionally if you study Varnashram, there's no um, Grihastha, obviously, and if you study very deeply, and then there's no Vanaprast. So they only follow two ashrams, they're sannyasis, they have, they're Brahmachari, they're sannyasi, and there's nothing else. Um, and then Grihasthas obviously follow the four, like the, the Vaishyas, the people of the mercantile class, they follow um, two, right? Um, they are Grihasthas, and they're Vanaprasts. And um, till the end. And uh, then they believe people who are more like workers, right? Like what they would say, sutras, or they generally just do uh, their Grihasthas, you know? It's all about nature. So the, the British, while studying the culture and tradition, turned it into this caste I am better than you, blah, blah, blah. It was a little bit there, the Brahmins around Mahaprabhu's time were a little puffed up uh, because of the potency and power, but the British turned it. So from that time, a lot has changed. And even in my research, I, I would find out really unique aspects, even worship of uh, Narsimhadev or the Vaikanasa Agamas or Pancharatra. The deeper you dive, you find the right people to learn the history, um, and especially the elderly people who have been around since the British time. Some of those older Indians are in their late 90s and they're still coherent. You can talk to them, they know the history. <clears throat> That's how I was able to find out a lot of stories of the temples and the history of the area. In the beginning, I didn't know. I would talk to the Pujari and in Ahogalam, they're like, yes, Narsimha manifests here. 
And then I would go to another temple, like hundreds of kilometers away, and it's, no, no, there's no manifest here. <laughs> I was so confused. And then I would go to Tamil Nadu, a different state, and they would say, oh, God, no, no, actually he manifests here. <laughs> and each state had their own, like he belongs to us. <laughs> so for years I was just finding his temples for my own kind of, I guess it was a, an addiction, you know, or like a domino effect, I kept going. And along the way, people are like, why are you doing this? But I never thought, why am I doing this? I was like, just in it. I was like, no, I have to do this. I gotta see another one, <laughs> find another one. And um, <clears throat> so a, a couple of swamis, interesting swamis, I think one of the first one, he was this small guy called, you know, Sai Baba, he had this, I just happened, I was going through his village to go to another Narsimhadev temple and I was on this bus and I go through this village and there's thousands of white people and I'm like, and it's in the middle of nowhere, Portapati. I'm like, what is going on here? <laughs> I thought maybe it was Jai Pataka Swami's, you know, Parikram, you know how you bring thousands of people sometimes. So I was like, I better get off and check out what's going on. So I get off and it's all Westerners and their kurtas, dhoti saris. I'm like, hey, what's going on, man? How are you <laughs> They're like, what? They start telling their chant is, I think they, it was like Sai Ram or something. They're very nice, polite people. They're like, you have to meet Swamiji. And I was like, who? And they're like, Sai Baba. I was like, okay, I'm here. I'll meet, I'll meet him. Why not? So I went inside and they were very strict. Mataji's women on this side, men on this side, and there was a big gap between them. <laughs> like, uh, so I went into this darshan hall, it was the size of a football field, maybe bigger. And I don't know, I didn't do the right thing. I didn't pay obeisances or something. So everybody was telling me to like bow. I was like, no, I'm not bowing. I want to see what's going on. <laughs> I want to. I'm not here with you people. I want to just can I watch? But they're. And so I saw Sai Baba up at the front, and he was, he was so small, little guy, and he, he whispered, he looked at me, um, and he had some sort of siddhi, they call it, some sort of power. Because you can't become, you can't get these positions without something, whether it was past life tapasya, whether in this life we can use it for good or bad. So, all, all of a sudden, they, one of his men, he whispered, and then he walked over and he said, you are free? Free after darshan? I said, oh, we're having darshan. Of, there's a temple? He said, no, no, Swamiji darshan. I was like, okay. I said, yeah. He said, oh, you come with me. So, um, at that time, I didn't realize Sai Baba, he liked long, you know, white points, but... He was actually one of the first to really help me and encourage me to do the book. And he was very kind, very sweet. Um, I just, after I went with him in his office room and we talked for hours about Narsimha. And he told me about some other temples from his childhood that he visited. And he was, he was like, is there, um, he was very soft-spoken, you know? He's like, is there anything I can do to help? And I'd never, I thought about that. What the hell, I'll do it myself. I don't need anybody's help. I was very young, you know, so it's, you know, when you're young, you want to. Uh, and I said, well, Swamiji, it's hard for me. Obviously, I don't speak the languages. <laughs> and, you know, my Sanskrit's not, we learned it when we were young, but it was a long time ago. I need, like, translators. And um, he said, how are you getting to these temples? I said, oh, bus, no problem. I even joked with him about the British. I said, you know, one of the best things the British did was the transportation, transportation system in India. It's fabulous. You can get a bus anywhere. Maybe not many buses to that place, and sometimes you have to wait the whole day, but there's always a bus. So <clears throat> he really helped me. And he gave me a couple of translators, and he gave me an old, like an ambassador. And he took me, there was five temples kind of near him. And 
before I left, he said, Drew, what are you, are you, you going to do like a book? I never thought about it. <laughs> I never thought, I was just thinking, no, 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 it's mine, mine, go to the next, go to the next. And it just hit me, a book, oh my God. He said, well, yeah, you should let other people see him. And um, it just was like, boom, a light bulb came on in my head. And back then there was no digital cameras. <laughs> now the, I mean, the, I don't even need a camera, I can just use this. The photos are so amazing. Before we had the big, huge. So I said, okay, I have to do this for people to let people enjoy. So <clears throat> after I went to these amazing temples, one of them was an Uber nursing home. And um, it was far out how he put that. And also Narayan Maharaj. Um, I never really hung out. I never hung out with these swamis. Everybody was really into these. I was always out doing my thing and time was going. So people were making connections with whatever, different groups or this one, that one. I was just in the jungles. But then I would come in and people were like, oh, do you know Narayan Maharaj? Oh, this Swami. And then oh, Gaur Govinda, he was funny. Gaur Govinda Swami, I met him. And he told me about the uh, essence of Jagannath is Narasimha, Narasimha is Jagannath. He was far out. So I would just come in, get the nectar blessings or ideas, and I'd be gone. So I went back to America to make money, and my dad had this old Minolta. I don't even know if it exists anymore, this brand. Minolta camera. It was, I think it might have been part of Nikon, a Nikon. He had it from the 70s, and it's a still a good camera, 35 millimeter. So I was like, Peter, can I have this? I'm gonna... And I used to travel with just that. And I would have like a, a couple of tiny dodies. You know, in the South, they have these dodies that come to your knees. Just a charter, <laughs> like nothing, just my camera. Because I would sleep at bus stations, on the buses, and there was always like a river or a kund to bathe in. So I would show up at a temple, go in, bathe, put my, wash my clothes, put them on, and it was so hot they would dry on you. It was, it was pretty crazy. So I had this camera, and then I started taking photos. And then hundreds of temples later, the first digital camera came out. It was 0.5 <coughs> megapixel. <laughs> and if anybody's tech here, they know that's completely crap. You can't do anything with 25. But I was so like happy. I was like, wow, this little thing, digital camera. Um, and all these all those photos were useless. I couldn't. I, you can blow them up like this big, you know. And, and the book I made is like this big. So, you know, it started like that. And then on the way, my my like. Uh, I guess it was a good selfish obsession. It became more like a, you know, how can I show him, right, to everyone? And I was still immature at realizing um, the, the the importance of Narshima in not just our Gaudiya Vaishnavism, all Vaishnavisms, the Madhvas, the Shri's, the Shankaras. I mean, there's the Parsis, the Sikhs, the, we're all interconnected, just different um, kind of lineages. But definitely, we're, you know, Brahma, Madhva, Gaudiya, Sampradaya is our. So the Madhva's, Madhva was an amazing, he was like Narsama all the way. And when he, before he left this place, he gave eight. Narsimha Murtis to his eight principal sannyasis. He could have given anything else, but he gave Narsimha. In particular, Yoga Narsimha. And he, just like us, we worship um, Guru, Guranga, then Narsimha, then Krishna. Guranga is Narsimha. You know, he manifests four or five times as Narsimha. And um, <clears throat> the foundation of their bhakti uh, is Narsimha. So the mantras, before they can worship their Ishtadev, which is Krishna, Krishna, they have to, they worship through Narsimha. 
So when, when each Swami has a Pariyar, it's their turn to worship. They bring their Narsimha from their ashram to the altar, and then they put him before Rupi Krishna, they worship Narsimha, and then after he's done, then they worship Rupi Krishna. Same with the Shri's in Sri Rangam, all these big temples, Madurai. They, um, before they can approach Ranganath, Vishnu lying on Ananta Sesh, they worship Narsimha. Again, the Ramanuja established this, you know, he was an unbelievable Narsimha Bhakta. Um, <clears throat> and he established very seriously how Narsimha's the Bhakti Vignasa in his uh, culture, and that he was threatened, almost poisoned, and killed on many occasions. And he took shelter of Narsimha. And Vijaya, Vijaya Srita Swami, I believe his name was, he's a mantra. He was such a devout Narsimha follower that there was many Jains who were kind of um, followers of Rishabh Dev, you know, who's an incarnation of the Lord. He's like the um, complete detached aspect of the Lord, you know. Total, like, in India sometimes we call him Babaji, or, like, didn't care about when he ate, where he ate, what he ate, food, if he had food, if he did, uh, clothes, if he wore them, if he didn't, where he slept, he, he totally detached. Like sometimes you see in India, we look at, we think they're crazy people, but actually we don't know. So the James were followers of, of this tradition of Rishabh Dev and they, some, I don't know, twisting and uh, concoctions have been there, but that's their main idea is that don't hurt any living entity, like Jad Bharat. So they'll have a broom and they'll wear a mask. <laughs> They're the original wasp mask wearers. <laughs> so they cover their, their nose and their whole, th and sometimes even glasses. They're, every inch of them is covered, the women and the men equally, from head to toe. The men also wear the, like we cover our head in, with the sari, they also wear that. And they sweep where they walk, <clears throat> because what if they kill an ant? Or like a micro, it's very, it's pretty far out actually. <clears throat> so the Jains were followers, but they had some heavy leaders and Ramanuja was preaching and Vijaya Jirta Swami was preaching, so they, some of the disciples tried to kill him. <laughs> and they did, they managed to poison his food and they didn't put a little poison. They put like the whole bottle of poison. And um, <clears throat> this is where this mantra of Lord Narsimha Astakam comes from. It's considered probably the most potent. Uh, it's, it's, it's very rooted in um, not the Tantra as we know in the West, which is quite strange. Um, it's more this conviction of I offer every part of my being, internal being, and my external being, like every inch of my body and mind and soul to the Lord in this prayer. And the Lord will protect me. So he knew he was being poisoned. I don't know if that means, but uh, she's going to die. So, he ate the poison. This hardly happened some six, seven hundred years ago. It's documented in the local history. And he started turning blue. You know, when you start dying, you start to turn blue. And he started chanting this mantra, you know. Rom, rom, din, din. So it's heavy duty mantra. <laughs> kill, kill, cut, cut, destroy, destroy. But it's actually talking about your attachment to you saying you're my enemies, my business. but it's like our enemies are most of the time us. <laughs> we cause our problems. So he was singing this heavy mantra and his Narsimha Didi, which is Yoga Narsimha, he was sitting in front of him <clears throat> and the Didi, he, was put, he put his hands on his feet because he, he started to leave and the blueness of his body went into the deity. And you can still see it, the deity has this blue, he's a bronze. 
but he has this bluish, like in this area, it's all blue. Like, so they believe that Hashem took this poison out of him. And you know, Jay, to, to, he, till his last breath, he pushed the importance of Neshama as the divine protector all throughout, you know, Tamil Nadu and Karnataka. And um, he was a devout follower of, uh, of Mantra. And then he was, uh, he, had a, he had many visions, uh, what is it, Dhyana of Narsimha. So many forms, he, you know, came from him. There's a particular form where Narsimha is standing and he has this mudra, um, or his hands down on Prahlad's head, like if your child is there, you know, you're patting them on the head. Same, Prahlad is standing, he's patting them. And then he's kind of blessing like this, it, where it's, come to me, you know, I'll protect you. So he had this vision, and a couple of temples, or forms were made. So this is, goes against like the Shilpa Shastra, which is part of the Agama Kosh, um, which are like, how to make the forms of the Lord. So the Lord created the Agama Kosh and the Shilpa Shastras. But then there's this Dhyana Shlok where certain saints, yogis, yoginis had visions or darshans of the Lord. Like in Simhachalam, this idol, we were all talking yesterday, Gorkeshava and Sachananda Swami, Krishna Chaitanya Swami, and the other devotees that were there when the idol, the, the Lord came. <clears throat> this form is, doesn't exist in Shilpa Shastra doesn't exist at all. There is no Prahlad Nesama. And generally Prahlad is not there. Um, and But because of the visions or love of the devotees, you know, he came like this, and they brought this drawing to the head, you know, expert back in the day. I think his name was, he was famous, famous, Stapati, expert in Vastu and the Vedas and the Shilpa Vedas. So he he looked and he said, hmm, interesting. <laughs> said, this form is not correct. Um, who, you know, how did this form come about? So then he understood it was like a, you know, a vision of the devotees, you know, the plural. And he sat on it for some time. And then he also had some sort of a vision where the Lord kind of guided him to, you know, this is okay. So then we have Prahlad Narsimha. A very potent deity, very potent deity. Um, and even he, he's not even made of the normal traditional, a lot of the, the deities in India are made on the East Coast, so Tamil Nadu. That's the area of the Shilpas. Um, and a little in Karnataka, but in Kerala, I was like, wow. So then it makes such sense how the Lord manifests you know, through his devotees. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, this beautiful faith, as I started, I continued traveling, this faith which stems from Prahlad, right? If you think about it, there's many life coaches now these days, right? Teachers and bless them all. But a lot of their teachings is coming from I, me, mine. I think, I feel, I believe. But the original life coach was Prahlad. If you study his teachings, he was so straightforward and honest, but he had no agenda, he had no envy, no jealousy, and he didn't judge. He just spoke the truth, but then he let his friends do what they want. He even gave them options. Well, you, okay, if you can't give everything up, then at least bring Bhagavan into your life, have a balance. So he was speaking about balance then, and we're all still speaking about it now. We're trying to balance. So his teachings are so relevant to these days, and 
as I traveled, I would kind of feel, especially the ones that were following the tradition of Sanatana Dharma, you know, Vedic culture, Vaishnavism, the Brahmins, the Nishama worshippers, um, they're all, they were so happy and mellow and easy and open. And even though they were strict, like some temples, I'm white, you know, a lot of temples, it's not so much racist as it is, um, the British took so much advantage, they, they took advantage that even in Jagannath Puri, the reason we're not allowed in is because the temple was taken advantage of. Uh, the British, you know, the invasions. So back then, um, they set this kind of weird rule that white, white people aren't allowed in. But actually, it's funny, my good friends there, I joke with them, I said, you know, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was kind of yellowy, you know? He was kind of a white dude. And I was like, but he got to go in. I was like, and, Mah and his brother was really white, you know, like the effulgence of the moon. And if you get into it deeper, it was because of a lot of invasions, you know, they were protecting the temple. Even back then, after even the British, they wouldn't even let locals or even incoming visitors come in because you know uh, so many things were stolen and jewels and a lot of stuff so they just kept it that way but for me even some temples this last trip when i was there last month i went to one temple and they said you're not allowed in here and i'd already been to that temple a hundred times and i said what um I said, yeah, you know, you're not, you're a white man, you're not Hindu. <laughs> so I, I was with my Indian friends and I said, I started laughing, I was like, you guys go ahead. And um, the guy who told me I couldn't go in there, he said, look, I'm sorry, I work here, it's not right, but that's the rules. And I was like, fair enough. But a lot of temples were like that, even Narsama temples priests were so kind and unenvious or jealous even if there was a rule somehow they just were like oh, God. quick 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 or they would tell me you know wait and then everybody leaves it was all by hand language you know I didn't know what the hell they were saying like they were talking to me in you know Telugu or Tamil or Kannada but I got it they were like five minutes don't lock it. So I would wait, you know, all the people would go, <laughs> and then they would come get me and bring me back open, go inside. And sometimes I was very wild. I would just walk on the altar, touch the D, and they'd be like, no, 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 but I would just do it. <laughs> and But then they were very sweet, you know. This mood of, of Prahlad had really kind of, this disciplic succession had really um, stayed real so they weren't trying to like own uh, Vaishnavism or you know worship of Narasimha they wanted to share it right sometimes you take a little advantage <laughs> get the mercy they say in his phone right uh, we're like when we were young they're like eat the nectar man right? get it yesterday too we were on the uh, I like to see people I prefer to listen to class than give class I prefer to watch the pujas than do them. And because I like to see devotees, their bhavs and their rasa and their love, you know, for the Lord. So yesterday I was sitting, they had nice abhishek and I was sitting in the corner. And my friend Amara is amazing, one of the leading experts in the world of um, the traditions of, yeah, puja and mantras and yajnas and everything. Amazing. So he was like, come and have, you know. I said, just let me sit here. And it was so awesome. I sat for like four hours. And then after the Abhishek, the, you know, Mataji's come and dress, which I'd never seen, you know. Mataji's dress in their Shami Didi. I was like, whoa. You know, because in India, it's like, it's not, you know, they have their traditions. So, and there were these, uh, the temple president's mom was there and seeing the vibe of the way they were dressing was so uh, beautiful. 
and there was volunteers and lots of Jesus, young people, old people. Um, you know, true followers of bhakti um, should read Prabhupada Maharaj's teachings because he was like the he taught us the core of what it is to be a devotee, you know. Uh, not just Narasimha, Krishna. Uh, for me, Krishna, Chaitanya, Narasimha, Jagannath is, is the same. Sometimes we like to create, you know, I, I'm a Narasimha Bhakta, I'm a Radha Krishna Bhakta. But, you know, the gopis call Krishna Narasimha Krishna. You know, Radha calls him as all the gopis because sometimes when they're playing, even the coward, you know, they're roughhousing and sometimes nails come out and they're like, oh, you're, you're Narsima, just like Narsima, Narsima Krishna, you're scratching us with your nails, so and Mahaprabhu manifest put fear in the Kazi as Narsima so you can't separate, it's just a different uh, mood, it's, it's Krishna very how do you say, um awesomely defending his devotee. I mean, come on, he came to protect this child. The past time only that, apparently, so he was only here for, it was like 45 minutes, even though some say they fought for thousands of years, that's not really too factual, but he came just so quickly, chuck a chuck, boom, and for this kid, unbelievable, you know, if you think about it, and Prahlad was the ultimate yogi. And what to speak of his dad? Prahlad only did the pasta for six years. His dad did for, I think, 60,000 years or some crazy amount. Standing, living on prana. He wasn't doing downward dog and all these, this awesome, that awesome. You know, every morning for half an hour, you know, in a class. He was standing there on his tippy toes, so determined. He was a real yogi, and Yarni Kashipu, if you really get into it, he was a devotee, obviously. And his only fault was one, because he did some stuff. He, he was a king, so obviously he was going to invade and take over the world. That's what kings do. They don't get karma for that. That's their dharma, to conquer and to rule. You know, he chopped off heads. He, all that stuff can be uh, cleansed through yagyas, which he did a lot of. He supported, he was a great devotee of Lord Shiva. His only fault was envy. Not lust, not anger, not pride, envy. And that's the, I think, our biggest problem as humans is we have sometimes envy and jealousy, you know. And Prahlad was non-envious of his classmates, and he never held a grudge, right? His, his um, people he knew from growing up. They were now told to stab him with spears and poison him, put him in the den with serpents, smash his head with an elephant. Because obviously he knew all these guards, right? And here they are having to, they, they didn't want to do it, but the king said they had to. He didn't bear a grudge up until the last minute. <laughs> And then Narsimha Purana, there's one Narsimha Purana, an old one I have. It translates, Hiranyakashipu was like, okay. So he's in this pillar, huh? He was mocking Prahlad, oh, okay. Your god is in this pillar. So I'm going to chop off your head. Let's see if your god comes out of this pillar to protect you. So imagine, you know, your dad's like, I'm going to kill you, man. You're done. Prahlad had, till the last minute, because of being a yogi, a true devotee, he was completely calm, equipoised. He didn't freak out. Wait a minute, I'm gonna die. Dad, no, you're so mean to me. He just kind of accepted it. And I think as a yogi, a true yogi, you kind of, in America there's a saying, water off a duck's back, or a swan. You know swans, they're waterproof. They can dive in, and you come out, and you're like, wait a minute, you just went underwater, but your ducks especially, they have this um, shiny coat. Um, even if water falls on them, it just goes right off. 
So it means you don't get bothered or bugged by things. So, and then his dad was killed. And Srimita was like, what can I give you? And, you know, think about it. God's there, right? And you could have anything. You could ask for, you know, to go hang out with him forever. You could ask him to, whatever. Prabhupada was like, free my father. Forgive my dad. That's, to me, like the ultimate yogi. He didn't want for himself. He wanted for others. And free his family. So then... 25 generations, Nishama purified. And then all these, Prahlad, you know, did all these beautiful, incredible prayers from the heart. And most of it was talking about everybody else, bless everybody else, give to everybody else your darshan. Because he wouldn't give them his darshan, the demigods, these, these poor, powerful people. Shiva God, because in our society, Shiva is so, he's such a good example of how to get